it's with pleasure now that I um, would like to introduce um, Anne Cahill, um, who's a professor of psychology, of, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> professor of philosophy at Elon University in North Carolina in the United States. And it's a real honour to have you here today, Anne. I've known Anne's work for over a decade since discovering her 2001 book, Rethinking Rape, um, which is an excellent book I'd highly recommend to people. Some years later, although we didn't know each other, we were both writing chapters for a book edited by um, Victoria Grace and Renee Herbeul called Theorising Sexual Violence. When I got the feedback on my chapter, which I was hoping was the last I had to do to it, I was sent a copy of Anne's chapter for the book and to told to please rethink my reference to objectification um, and take a look at her, um, light of her new concept of um, derivatisation. It's possible that I was a little irritated at that suggestion. Uh, <laughs> um, and I thought the term sounded a bit clunky, derivatisation. But it has it's since come to be um, a term that has, I've found invaluable in thinking through um, kind of issues around what we might have called objectification, but getting a much more kind of nuanced and sophisticated um, way of thinking about what's wrong with that. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to have Anne here today to talk about that work. And um, I've left the second page of my notes over there, but I think her second book is called Overcoming Objectification, published in 2010, which is um, a marvellous book. I've only managed to read the first few chapters so far, but because I've been taking so many notes as I'm going. Um, but I'm really looking forward to finishing that on sabbatical and um, looking forward to hearing a bit more about your ideas um, today. So welcome and thank you. And I want to thank Dr. Nicola Gavey and as well as Paulette Benton Gregg. They have been incredibly patient with this person flying across the world for the first time. And I had lots of questions and I pestered them and they were so gracious. And it's a real honor to, for me to be with you today to talk about this. I, sometimes I describe being a philosopher as that we, we, are, we are slow in a certain way. We get confused before anyone else gets confused. You know, people say, "Well, men and women and philosophers go, hold on, whoa, 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 what are you talking about?" Okay. Um, and sometimes, though, we're also very fast and we do conceptual moves very, very quickly. So I want to try something new that I haven't done before yet, and I'm, I'm going to ask your indulgence. Twice in this talk, I'm going to take a one-minute break. I'm going to steal a couple minutes from the Q&A period and put them right plop down in the middle of the talk. And I, I want to do this because sometimes I think, particularly maybe with philosophy talks, we go very quickly and then we say, hey, any questions? And you can't even remember, right, the first couple of pages that were done. So um, that time can be quiet if you just want to take some notes, clarify your questions, right, that you can ask later. If, we, if there are burning questions that you need to have um, answered before I go on, we'll deal with them there. This can also be time for you to turn to your neighbors and say, did you have any idea what she was talking about? And they may be able to help you. Um, so, and they'll just be about a minute, and then I'll start up again. But I think this will really help us to have an exchange, because I really do want this to be more of a discuss discussion than a lecture. So what I'd like to do with you today, and I do like to talk and move at the same time. Um, there's more research being done on how important walking is to thinking. Interesting. Um, it's certainly true for me. What I'd like to do with you today is think carefully about the ways in which our understandings of the body and the person underline ethical analyses of sex work of all sorts. In fact, more specifically, I want to demonstrate that one common thread that has run through many feminist criticisms of sex work, namely the thread of objectification, okay, is in fact deeply problematic. So I'm not saying that objectification is ethically wrong. I'm making a philosophical point that the concept of objectification has metaphysical baggage that feminists should be wary of. So I think of objectification as this theoretical workhorse. I mean, it's done a lot of work for us. It's done some great work, right? But there are some underlying assumptions functioning within it that we should be really wary of. So my first goal is to try to convince you that the very concept of objectification is itself questionable precisely on feminist grounds. So this is an imminent critique, okay? Both in general and specifically with regard to sex work. 
Now, once I've done that, if I manage to pull that off, I then want to argue that just because objectification doesn't provide that sturdy foundation for an ethical analysis of sex work doesn't mean that we're off the hook. Okay? That doesn't mean that sex work is now ethically completely unproblematic. Right? We're still left with ethical quandaries. We're still left with ethical problems. And they must be addressed. We just need to address them in a way that doesn't run into the kind of metaphysical pitfalls that objectification leads us to. We need to do a better job. And to that end, I offer a new concept that Nicola's already mentioned. Based on the work in, uh, of Lusa Rigori, I call it derivatization. You can put the syllables differently if you like. That's fine with me. Um, it is, in fact, incredibly clunky, drives the mathematicians crazy. Um, and I always, whenever I give a talk on it, I always say, please, if you can come up with a better term, please give it to me, because I would like a better term. But grammatically and philosophically, it works, so I'm sticking with it. All right, and I think that term, that concept, derivatization, can help illuminate the potential ethical wrongs that much, although perhaps not all, of sex work and contemporary Western society involves. OK, so let's start with objectification. Generally speaking, and I'm really, I'm not going to talk too much about them by names, but I'm really referring to the works of Martha Nussbaum, Ray Langton, and Linda Lamonchek, which are some of the few feminist theorists that have actually taken on objectification in a detailed way. And generally, they all agree. When we say that a human person has been objectified, we mean that the person has been treated as if they were an object. Right? OK. A merely material entity, a passive recipient of action, devoid of the characteristics that endow a human subject with moral dignity, particularly the traits of rationality and autonomy. Note the opposition underlying all these moves. Pay attention here, right? If you are to be associated with the material body is to be rendered less than a person. Materiality versus subjectivity, OK? To be associated with passivity is to be rendered less than a person. Passivity, activity, hierarchies, right, oppositions. To, be, to have one's autonomy encroached upon is to be less than a person, OK? So using objectification as a tool of ethical analysis seems to commit us to a model of the self that is primarily disembodied, self-contained, and prior to relations with each other. Right? Sound familiar? This is Kant. This is most of modern Western philosophy. Who is the self? Why does the self have any dignity and moral worth? Because the self is self-contained, individual, independent. We might have social contract theory. How does that work? Well, here I am. I exist. And then I choose rationally and autonomously to enter into relations with others. OK, well, it's been roundly criticized, this model, right? It, it fails to make sense of a whole bunch of interesting things. So we've got Rousseau saying, let's take man as we find him in his natural state, wandering through the jungle, getting his own food. OK? And feminists are going, yeah, that's not where the story starts, right? All right, someone was there before all that walking and all that finding of the food. All right, this is a very strange place to start the story of personhood. OK, so it's also been a model that has historically been used to marginalize women, people of color, disabled persons, just to name a few categories. But it seems particularly ill-equipped to make any sense out of sexuality as a potentially life-enhancing activity. You know, this is why Kant was completely perplexed. Right? He's like, oh my good Lord almighty. If you ever read Kant on sex, if you haven't, go do it. Good Lord. And he is in complete knots about it. How can this ever be ethical? See, when you start with that notion of the person, sexuality shows up immediately as a problem that needs to be solved. How can it ever be OK? And Kant does all of these philosophical backflips. Suddenly, it's OK if we both objectify each other at the same way in the same time, and it's sort of OK. But you can, you can hear the wrinkle in his nose when he writes about it. <laughs> I'm going to have some um, fairly lengthy quotes from my last book. This is one of them. In remaining loyal to certain tenets of modern thought, such as the privileging of autonomy and rationality and subjectivity, feminist analyses of objectification fail to recognize significantly, sufficiently the role the body plays in subjectivity. This failure, despite the theorist's best efforts 
to articulate the conditions of positive sexual interactions leads to an implicit vilification of the body and at times of sexuality itself. Crucial questions about sexuality and subjectivity remain. How can objectionable and non-objectionable erotic encounters be distinguished from each other? How can feminist thought account for the pleasure that can derive from being gazed upon, being perceived and approached as sexually attractive, and being erotically involved with other bodies? How can it explain the sense that such erotic involvements can serve not to destroy or undermine subject subjectivity, but rather to enhance our sense of being with? In a related point, these theories tend to leave us in a space where materiality and passivity are linked indelibly to a lack of subjectivity, a conclusion that places severe and ultimately untenable constraints upon subjectivity, agency, and personhood. Again, inherent in the pejorative sense of the word objectification is the assumption that to be an object, a material thing, is contrary to subjectivity and its most valuable trait, autonomy. In turn, the privileging of autonomy leaves little room to explore the ways in which relations constitute the self and its ability to act in the world. Uh, let me take a break from the quote just to emphasize that point. When I am talking about a model of the self that is relational, I am not leaving behind all concerns of autonomy and agency, but I'm flipping their order. Okay, so rather than first we've got autonomy and agency, and that's what makes relations okay, I flip that and say autonomy and agency come out of relations. The most basic unit of human existence is at least two. The relation is foundational, not the one. There is no one. And that's going to have some interesting echoes when I try to get into a rigor eye. I'm making a slightly different point that a rigor eye is going to make, but it's similar. There is no one, but one only comes out of, but is always also in relation with an other. Okay, back to my quote. Finally, it seems that these analyses do not sufficiently illuminate some paradigmatic examples of the objectification of women. Women as sex objects are often not comparable to other objects, particularly inanimate ones. They seem to occupy an odd, confusing space between subject and object, a space that perhaps does not recognize the subject-object distinction, but complicates and troubles it. In any case, this space is not effectively described by mere reference to turning women into things. Something more complicated and more subtle is going on here. Let's take one of those one minute breaks, okay? And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that point, okay? So quick one minute break, check in with yourself or with others. That is extremely promising. That's good, that's good. Um, any burning questions? Anything that's got to be addressed before we go on? Again, I've, I'm gonna leave, nope, there goes the thing. I'm going to leave quite a bit of time for questions at the end, but anything, you know, sometimes they just can't wait. No, we're good? I'm not really sure this is, it might fall off again. We're gonna deal with it. Okay, so I've tried to argue so far that there's something wrong with the general notion of objectification, that it comes to us saddled with questionable metaphysical baggage. Let's look more specifically at sex work right now as an example of social and political, a social and political phenomenon that's often been analyzed through the lens of objectification. And we can sketch this approach pretty easily, right? It's pretty familiar. Sex work, the argument goes, objectifies women by treating them as mere sex objects. That mere is really interesting to me, okay? And by commodifying that which should not be commodified, their sexuality. Analyses of pornography that take this approach emphasize the degree to which women are portrayed as mere things reducible to, no, nope, I'm gonna hold it, I think. Reducible to their bodies. See, see, it, 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 there it is, right? Capable of being reduced to the body. Yet I would argue that such an approach to sex work misses fundamental characteristics of sex work and its social and political meanings. Perhaps most strikingly, it ignores the fact that however sex workers are represented or act, they are, above all, not functioning as inert objects. That's precisely what they're not doing, okay? I write, sex workers obviously act in ways that distinguish them from other things. 
Sex workers, whether they dance, perform sexual acts, or strip, must enact behaviors and attitudes that cannot be enacted by entities that we usually call things. In fact, it is crucial that sex workers appear as persons, persons experiencing certain emotions, desires, or even physical sensations. They may be expected to enjoy whatever sex acts are required of them and indicate that such sex acts result in sexual satisfaction. We've seen this already with this discussion of how you define violence in pornography, right? With some people saying, hey, if she's represented as liking it, then it doesn't count as violence. Well, of course, pornography requires the sex worker to give consent. Ray Langton has a book called Sexual Solipsism. I don't like it very much, but um, she makes one really interesting point that I need to work with more, which is about how agency is co-opted. Not overwhelmed, but co-opted in pornography. Otherwise, I think she's pretty somatophobic, but. Um, okay. Alternatively, clients may hope that sex workers experience and or express humiliation or pain, and in some cases achieve sexual satisfaction through that humiliation or pain. Clients may even demand that sex workers express what would obviously be the illusion of affection and love, but it has to be there. In other words, engaging the services of a prostitute is significantly different from using a blow-up doll to satisfy one's sexual desires and fantasies. They've got to be subjects. They've got to be persons. Doesn't work otherwise. So that's my first problem with using objectification to analyze sex work. It cannot illuminate for us the ways in which sex workers must enact behavior that only subjects, that is sentient human beings, can enact. They are precisely not objects. In addition, and more generally, if sex workers were degraded by being associated with the body and sexuality, or with passivity, then all of sexuality could potentially be called into question. Together with all embodied interactions that involve some sort of monetary compensation, and maybe even more than that, maybe all embodied interactions where the other is affecting my being. Okay. Specifically, it encourages the use of objectification, it encourages the adoption of a victim-victimizer dichotomy, it implicitly sets sexuality apart from personhood. So when Martha Nussbaum faces, she faces the same problem that Kant does because she's using a Kantian version of the person, except Nussbaum, unlike Kant, says, this doesn't make sense because sometimes, you know, sex is good, right? How do, we, how do we represent that? And she has a model where she sort of says, well, here's what happens. As long as the relationship recognizes each person in their autonomy and dignity, then somehow that makes it okay when they throw off their autonomy and dignity for a temporary amount of time and go a little nuts. <laughs> and then as long as they go back to their corner, it's okay. Because she recognizes that part of the good of sexuality is a blurring of autonomy, is a giving over of autonomy. How she can reconcile that? Well, I don't think she can, as it turns out. Okay. <laughs> um, the other thing about objectification uh, as a tool of analysis is that ultimately it remains unable to distinguish clearly sex work from other kinds of work. Now, I have to be fair about this. So does my analysis. The difference is I don't care, okay? I think, and, and I'm echoing something that Nicholas said here, I think we have to be very careful about sequestering sex work as somehow a highly privileged site of misogyny or inequality that is somehow different so my ethical analysis I'm going to share with you of sex work necessarily leads to a questioning of other forms of work as well. Okay. But other feminist analyses want to say there's something different about sex work. Okay. So, so we've got this problem. Okay. Objectification isn't doing the work that I think it needs to do. Um, what do we do? I suggest that we adopt a different ethical model of the self entirely one that rejects the modern modern of the self in favor of one that places both embodiment and relations with others at the center of subjectivity. I'm suggesting that we refuse the model of the disembodied, self-contained, autonomous self in favor of the relentlessly embodied, always in relation to others, and this is the real kicker, the sexually differentiated self. So that's a new thing. I haven't introduced that. This is the 
this is, this is tough. This is because um, in order to talk about the sexually differentiated self, I rely heavily on the work of Lusa Rigori. She's a very controversial thinker in feminist philosophy. So let me get just a little bit into her work here. Um, Rigori's theory of sexual ethics urges us to abandon the masculine notion, masculinist notion that the human species is a singular, unified, gender neutral category. She's like, that's no, no, it's not true. There is no human being, okay, from a rigorous perspective. This faith in oneness, she claims, has always been a dangerous illusion, one that has served to render women not only unequal but inferior. Women as always having less of that one characteristic, whatever it was, and it changes, right? Sometimes it's rationality, sometimes it's autonomy, sometimes it's genius, whatever. You know, women always have less of it, okay? That is so central to human worth. And in fact, that's helpful to see how Irigaray works. Irigaray is saying, when we adopt a singular standard, okay, women are not qualitatively different from men. They're quantitatively different. They're, they're less. Okay? They've got less of whatever matters. You know, this counts for genitalia too, right? Um, okay. Irigaray tells us that gender inequality doesn't come from the mistaken belief that women are different from men. That's what Beauvoir would say, right? The othering. Irigaray's like, no, no, no. Um, but from the mistaken belief that men and women can be compared according to a singular gender neutral standard, whatever form that standard takes. So a physical strength, we say, well, women are not as strong as men. Irigaray says, what do you mean by strong? Right? If you measure it by upper body strength, well, yeah, but upper body strength isn't a gender neutral measure of strength. Do it by capacity to, to withstand pain and suddenly it looks different. But a rigorized point is that there is no one universal method of strength because there's no one universal human being. Okay. The human species, a rigorized says, is always and already differentiated. Always and already grounded in a difference that cannot be transcended or erased. There is no one, and when a rigori is thinking the best she possibly can, she says there is always at least two. There's always at least two. Yet that difference has been ignored, denied, hierarchized into oppressive structures that construct women not as different from men, but as less than men. So you can think of the Vitruvian man, right? The model of the ideal human being. This is a rigorized example. This is not a rigorized example. It's my example of a rigorized thought. To say, that has been the representation of human being. A rigorized says, no, that is the representation of one version of the human being. And it cannot be used to measure all. A rigorized solution is to recognize women, and this is my term here, as ontologically distinct from men. And when, when she talks about sexual difference and an ethics of sexual difference, she is not talking about complementarity. Okay? She's not talking about the yin and yang. Because if you understand one side of the yin and the yang as half of a whole, you can reconstruct the other half, can't you? That's not difference. The difference is not the difference of a mirror or a half. And a rigor, I have to say at this point, is utterly uninterested in the content of that difference. So this is not men are from Mars, women are from Venus stuff. Okay? She doesn't know. She says, we have the foggiest idea who women are. We don't know. Okay? So she's not putting in the content. When, I, when I'm explaining this to class, I often say, sexual difference for a rigor eye is like the difference between my shoe and the carpet. It's the difference of texture that allows for movement. If there's no difference between my shoe and the surface, especially if I'm not a very good ice skater, right? I can't move forward. Difference is what allows us to move. Okay. If men and women are ontologically distinct, if their being does not take the form of a whole made out of complementary parts, then we run into ethical problems when we construct or treat women as if they were reducible to the subjectivity of men. And it's that move 
that I call derivatization. From my book, grammatically, derivatization follows the structure of the term that I want to replace. If objectify means to turn something that is not an object into an object, then to derivatize means to turn something that is not a derivative into a derivative, or to treat it as if it were. To derivatize is to portray, render, understand, or approach a being solely or primarily as the reflection, project, or expression of another being's identity, desires, or fears. The derivatized subject becomes reducible in all relevant ways to the derivatizing subjects, I'm sorry, the derivatized subject becomes reducible in all relevant ways to the derivatizing subject's existence. Any other elements of her being or subjectivity are disregarded, ignored, or undervalued. Should the derivatized subject dare to demonstrate aspects of her subjectivity that fall outside of the derivatizer's being, she will be perceived as arrogant, treasonous, and dangerously rebellious. The, <laughs> the wife who understands her role as fulfilling whatever desires her husband has, the mother whose identity is entirely wrapped up in her child's progress, the adolescent girl who is learning that sexy means whatever her heterosexual male peers allegedly find attractive, these are all paradigmatic examples of sexual derivatization. Note that when we use derivatization as an ethical tool, we do not end up vilifying or marginalizing the body. Indeed, bodily specificity plays a central role in a rigorized thought. The fact that we cannot imagine a sex-neutral human body proves her own point. Okay? There is no one human body. The body is always marked sexually. A rigor gets in trouble for that and she deserves it. But there's, I, I would argue, um, contrary to some Arigarine scholars, that to acknowledge the plurality of sexualities um, is completely consistent with Arigarine's analysis. Some argue that she needs the binary. Um, I don't think she does. She might think she does, but she should stop thinking that way. Um, <laughs> Irigaray, perhaps more than any other contemporary feminist thinker, thinks from the body, using the sexed body as an argument for and an illustration of the centrality of sexual difference. Embodiment for Irigaray is central to human existence and experience, and her ethics of sexual difference is a resounding rejection of those models of the self that sought to deny or denigrate the body in relation to personhood. Nor, I argue in my book, does derivatization include an implicit valuing of autonomy. One of the primary philosophical motivators for a rigorized privileging of difference is the need to account for an ethical interaction. She's trying to figure out, and it is true that she's pretty heteronormative on this point, maybe just damn right, you know, outright heteronormative. She's trying to figure out how can men and women have ethical interactions. That's her problem. Okay? And so, when that, that ethical interaction is central to her philosophical project. It's necessary. And Irigaray claims that any interaction that is not grounded in a primary recognition of the differences between the beings who are interacting is not an interaction at all. The husband who is conversing with an obedient wife, it turns out, is only talking to his own reflection. <laughs> it's not a dialogue. It's a monologue, okay? There's no difference there. So the point of a rigorized sexual difference is not to protect complete self-determination, but to engage in true interaction and in true dialogue. So a rigorized talks a lot about wonder. We must approach the other with wonder, knowing that the other cannot be captured by our own existence. Our existence is by definition limited, not universal, and we can't transcend it. Let's take another minute break. Right, right. So there's, there's no doubt that even within oppressive relations that I would still call derivatizing, there's a possibility for agency, okay? I, in fact, mostly, even in my work on sexual violence, I, I usually end up arguing that agency is never completely obliterated or transcended. That's not the way power works, okay? That's not the way it works. But what I'm focusing on is her role as obedient wife requires her to determine what she says almost entirely by 
what the husband needs to hear in order for her to get her own way. So it's this, it, he's the reference point. His, and his power is the reference point. But I'm also thinking of, of ways in which at least the dominant culture wouldn't recognize it as oppressive. I'm thinking of Rousseau and, and you know, the little tiny part of Rousseau's Emile that was about Sophie. I don't know if you've ever read that. You know, there's a whole big thing on how we, you know, what do, how do we teach Emile, right? And then there's a little thing, what do we teach Sophie? Yeah, because Emile wants some conversation in the end of the evening, right? <laughs> so we teach her just enough so that he's not bored when he comes in from the public realm. Now, does that mean that Sophie doesn't learn anything interesting? No. Does that mean that she has nothing to say? No. But it does mean that she is a speaking subject. What, her, what she speaks, the value of what she speaks, is completely defined by whether he's having a pleasant conversation. Okay? And if Sophie goes off script and says, dude, you're talking about all this equality stuff, you know, and I can't go to university? Okay? The reason that that is disobedient is precisely because that's not the conversation he wants to have, and the good wife is supposed to give the conversation. That's what it means to be a good wife. And at least in the United States, this book is written every 10 years like clockwork. Okay, in the 80s, it was um, fascinating womanhood. Okay, um, was it the 90s that it was the secret? And then the thousands, it was the rules? It's the same book. And it says, imagine how your husband feels if you're able to fix a car. Oh. <laughs> that, does, that doesn't go. So you must become the person who can't fix the car in order for him to be who he can be who he wants to be, and who you, apparently, in some metaphysical world, want him to be. So don't go out and get a job and buy yourself a mink coat. This is all fascinating womanhood, because I grew up in the 80s, and my mom was trying hard. Um, <laughs> don't go out and get a job and buy yourself a mink coat. First of all, think about that. But um, you, know, you just let one tear come down your cheek, because that's what works. So I'm also talking about the obedient wife in a very general way. There were two other burning questions. Yeah, so I'll repeat the question. Um, it, she asked, could I expand on the notion of the sexually differentiated self? What does it mean to be a sexually differentiated self? And what is a rigor I talking about that? Okay, so a rigor I says that if we're gonna get to sexual, any, sexual equality, men and women have two different jobs. Okay, so first of all, that, that's a typical rigor I move, okay? We're not all supposed to do the same thing. We've got different jobs because we're sexually differentiated. We're not the same. We're not the same position locally and so forth. She says men have the challenge, after a couple thousand years of Western history and philosophy and religion and all sorts of other things, to learn that they are not gods. <laughs> and that they cannot encompass all that is important or valuable of humanity. Okay? In other words, they have to become limited in their masculinity. We see this move in a lot of systems of inequality, right? So um, in my country, in the United States, um, you know, white people are extremely thin-skinned and do not like to be reminded of their racial identity. <laughs> no, we're just people. <laughs> we don't see color. <laughs> and if only everyone would just be people, it would be better, okay? And, uh, and there are thinkers, I think of Franz Fanon as one of them, who do an Arigarayan move, I mean, on his own, but it's, it's resonant, that say, you know, if we're going to get to racial inequality in a culture like the US, white people have to realize that they're white, <laughs> and that their whiteness matters, and that their whiteness structures their lives, and that they don't have access to a sort of race-neutral reality. Okay? But they are, they have a lens. It's a lens that is masked, right? It's the lens that is no lens. Okay? Um, a rigori is saying the same thing. Okay? Except that a rigori, unfortunately, I keep, you know, I love a rigori and I can't, I can't resist these little digs because she, she's wrong in important ways. She's utterly uninterested in race and she's wrong about that. And she need not be, but she is. Um, <laughs> but with regard to gender, she says, this is, the, this is the task. Men do not represent humanity. 
They can't. They're limited. Women, says a rigor I, have to find their universal. Women have been relentlessly individualized in a way, have not engaged with their ontological specificity, have not found. Now again, a rigor is not saying, listen, if you get together with women, you'll find out that you all like to knit or something like that. You know, <laughs> it's not like that. It's not like that. But she says women haven't addressed their becoming as women. Okay, so uh, let me make it concrete one more time. Um, in, our, in my culture, you know, the wedding is still this, this, you know, thing that girls talk about when they're six years old. I remember I had a bridal doll. I mean, that's weird, right? But I had a bridal doll, and I remember thinking to myself, when I get married, not if, when, um, I'm going to have a dress just like that. And I remember thinking to myself, now I know when I'm old enough to get married, I'm not going to think that dress is pretty, but I'm going to be wrong. So I'm going to force myself to wear that dress. I was thinking ahead. Okay. And, and the point is that girls and women are encouraged to think ahead about the wedding, right? Right? This is, this is a transformative moment. And you get stuff. I know, I got my doctorate. I'm like, I could really use a Cuisinart. You know, can, can, I, can I please get a microwave? I got a doctorate, isn't that something? No, but promise to be heterosexual monogamous. You get that Cuisinart, you get that microwave. Um, what, what is this highlight? This highlight of my existence that renders me real, that renders me visible, that renders me a celebrity for the day, it's the connection to a man. And at least in the States, I don't know how different it is, when the bride enters the public space of the wedding, right? Everyone stands, everyone's ready for her. She enters, when did the groom appear? I don't know. He just, <laughs> he showed up all of a sudden somewhere. No one was paying any attention. And he's wearing a suit that some other guy was wearing last week. <laughs> Doesn't transform him. But my identity is transformed. It is subsumed and there's legal language, at least still in the United States, from the British law that we inherited that literally says, right, you are under the man. The British law that my country's law is based on said, in marriage, the two become one. Ah, oh, so nice. Um, except, <laughs> except that the next phrase is, and that one is the husband. I hope that helped. We can keep working on this. One more burning question. Yeah, so the derivatization, I need it because I need to speak of a way of subjectivity, women's subjectivity, being completely organized by another subjectivity, completely known. You know what the dirty little secret about porn is? Most of it, it's boring. <laughs> it's predictable. We know exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> I want to argue, and I'm going to get to that point now, is that the problem with the representation of women in porn and sex work is not that they're treated like bodies but that they're treated as known. That all of their subjectivity, their speech, their dress, their actions, are all determined by another subjectivity. And I don't have time to get into this, but that other subjectivity is just as fabricated. <laughs> Let's not pretend that it has any reality either, okay? It's not like we take what real, actual living men want in some sort of neutral way and say, but the hegemonic, masculine, identity determines. Prostitutes do not wake up and thinking, what piece of clothing makes me feel sexy? It gives me the, like that, that moo moo. Do we have moo moos? <laughs> Just, I love the way I feel in a moo moo. You know, I feel loose, I feel comfortable, I feel fluid, that that's what works for me. That's not the thought process. Okay. Okay. So let's get to that a little bit. What can derivatization tell us of sex work? It's my claim that sex work, as currently practiced in contemporary Western societies, almost always involves sexual derivatization. Since sexual derivatization occurs in a variety of contexts, let me describe it a little bit um, before applying it to sex work. And this is, again, a quote from my book. Sexual derivatization entails a rendering of a sexual partner as nothing more than a mirror of one's own desires. Let me bracket here for it. Along the lines of this analysis, um, pornography is a problem, prostitution is a problem. You know what's also a problem? Dating sites. What I'm looking for in a partner. 
must be this, 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 this. Okay? It's equally problematic. The other shows up as, more, as a more or less successful fulfillment of those desires. And the sexualizing gaze is no more than a yardstick that measures that success. The problem in the derivatizing mode is not the presence of preferences. I'm continuing to work on this little problem in some current thought, current work. An ethics of sexuality cannot demand that every human being is equally attracted to all other human beings. We'd have a problem there, okay? nor are human beings in conscious control of the particularities of their sexual desires. The problem comes in elevating those preferences to the point where they both dominate the sexual interaction and are constructed as appropriately unaffected by that interaction. In other words, the sexual preferences of one of the sexual partners becomes the organizing principle of the interaction itself, dictating virtually all of its aspects, and requiring that interaction to merely fulfill and not potentially transform those desires. Such a situation negates the human presence of the other by failing to recognize their sexual ontological distinctiveness, which by definition will not and cannot match up perfectly to a pre-existing list of demands. So I'm working with an ethics of interaction here, and to sum it up in a blunt way, but a rigor, I just, I'm really thinking with a rigor right here. I would say, for an interaction to be ethical, everyone's got to have some skin in the game. Everyone's got to be open to the other. To be it can't be, listen, this is what I like, this is what I like, this is what I like. You do it or you don't. <laughs> and among the many problems with that, with that approach is that it doesn't understand the development of sexual desires very well. Right? Desires aren't innately, individually held, fixed, right? Desires are affected by interactions. Okay? My, my husband's family has their roots in the Midwest the United States. They think that a particular salad is delicious. It's made up of green lime jello <laughs> with celery and olives mixed in. It's not right. <laughs> it's not correct. Um, it's not food, but they love it. <laughs> There's no innate desire to like that. And I don't understand why we would see sexual desires as anything different. So to enter into a relationship means you've got to throw your desires in there to maybe be transformed by the other. Pornography, prostitution, by and large, doesn't do that. The problem with sexual derivatization is that it prohibits what a rigor I and I would recognize as an actual interaction with between ontologically distinct beings. As a rigor I says, an ethical interaction should be marked by wonder. The understanding that the other can never be reduced to oneself, can never be fully known, is always embodying a human reality that is distinct from my own. Only when an interaction is marked by this kind of wonder can it have the possibility of transforming, although not in a predictable way, my always becoming sense of self. I need difference. Okay? One of the things I like about a rigor eye and the other is, is this, this phenomenological sense that you know, I can't have access to my body unless I interact with something that's not my body. Okay? If you wear a watch for a long time, you can't feel it, right? So you take it off and you feel its absence. We cannot have access to our embodied beings except for difference, to know that there is not us out there. Okay. Um, but when I force the other to be a mere reflection of my desires and my needs, I flatten that ontological distinction, and now there's no true interaction, no wonder, only a paltry reading of a singly authored script. So I write in my book, it is not because she is treated like a thing that makes the prostitution encounter unethical. It's because she is treated as a derivatized woman. The subjectivity that she is allowed must be reducible to the sexual desires of her clients, and so it is a subjectivity that cannot recognize her ontological distinction. And yet sex work is not the only place where persons are sexually derivatized, or in fact just derivatized. I, I'm not talking about a lot. There are all other forms of derivatization that are not distinctly sexual. Yet the necessary role that money plays in sex work guarantees that derivatization will be at work. After all, one must sell what a customer wants. And in sex work, that means that the sex worker must embody a sexuality that matches as perfectly as possible the sexual desires of the client. Asserting one's own sexual desires is not only not part of the job description, but deeply antithetical to it." Unquote. I said that, now I'm going to take it back. 
because that's too strong. That's actually too strong. I want to conclude my remarks here by arguing that, in fact, there's nothing necessarily derivatizing about exchanging sexual services for money. We can inform forms of sex work. We can imagine forms of sex work that do not entail the ethical wrong of derivatization. In fact, um, some forms are already in existence, although I would argue they're relatively rare in West, contemporary Western society. What would be necessary to render sex work ethical, I argue, is a robust recognition of ontologically distinct expertise on the part of the sex worker, such that her subjectivity could not be understood as a mere reflection of the client's subjectivity. Much as a lawyer or a doctor bring to their client relationships knowledge and skills that are central to the work and that exceed the subjectivity of the client, so too could sex workers be seen as professionals with unique knowledge and skills. From my book, what if sex workers were constructed not as sexual beings required to fulfill the client's desires and fantasies, but as experts in sexual interactions? What if clients approach such interactions not as a refuge from intersubjective encounters, as I think they often are, but as a means of expanding their sexual intersubjectivity? Just as a client may approach a lawyer for help in navigating a difficult legal situation, or as a patient may seek the guidance of a doctor to ameliorate pain or discomfort, one can imagine a client seeking out the expertise of a sex worker to broaden sexual fluency, or to learn to provide or experience more intense sexual pleasure. And although that client may have a general kind of objective that they're seeking, just as the doctor's patient is seeking health, she will quite properly, she or he will quite properly have only a vague or incomplete set of ideas as to how the sex worker may act to achieve that objective. Perhaps more precisely, achieving that objective will necessarily require both parties to interact, to share knowledge of which the other is unaware, to consider options, to make decisions, and perhaps ultimately to engage in a sexual partnership. Um, Again, as I said, this analysis leads to um, critical analyses of other forms of work. And I always think at this point in the paper, I always think of Michael Jackson's death. Very, very wealthy people often end up with really, really bad doctors. Because they look around until they find a doctor who will do anything. And the doctor who will do anything is not using their ontologically specific expertise. Okay, so I have argued that understanding sex work in terms of derivatization avoids the problem that objectification led us to. We don't vilify the body, sexuality isn't a problem, right, while still illuminating some of the ethical harms. Um, understanding sexuality itself in this approach is not associated with degradation, rather the grounding ethics is one that recognizes sexual distinctiveness and understands any violation of that distinctiveness as a harm committed against the integrity of a human being. The derivatized sex workers understood not as an object, a thing, but as a too limited subject, a stunted subject, a subject whose actions, attitudes, and behaviors are entirely dictated by an other. Because sexuality is a crucial element in embodied intersubjectivity, its commodification rightly warrants suspicion. To reduce sexuality to something that could be traded is to risk failing to recognize a human being's sexual specificity, and that is the corner of an ethics of sexual difference. However, understanding sex work in terms of derivatization is not to say that it is the only place where derivatization occurs or that we cannot imagine forms of sex work that do not involve derivatization. Thank you. I'm a student, so please forgive my uh, too early critique. Maybe I will read more after this. Um, I was a bit disappointed that your deconstruction of the notion of objectification, for me, it's not radical enough. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, you have successfully demonstrated but that sex workers are not object, they are subject. But in this way, I think ontologically, you reinforce the binary of subject and object. Um, for example, the uh, you use the example of blow up dolls as if having sex with sex worker it's more ethical uh, it's better than uh, having sex with blow up dolls or trees or uh, sex toys or and I look for 
Uh, I recently read a perspective uh, which I don't really understand, which extends the notion of power and agency and subjectivity non to non-human subject, that objects are actually agentic and we don't treat them as they are objects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good question. I think I probably deal with that a little bit better in the book where I have a little bit more time. But you're absolutely right that in this, in this talk, I, I, still, I still alluded almost to a distinction between subject and object, right, and, and reified it. And, and, and I don't want to do that in my philosophy. I want to show the subject-object distinction as one of those many dichotomies that are hierarchized, seen as distinct, but in fact require each other for their own existence. And in terms of, um, say, phenomenology or existentialism, I would absolutely be part of the tradition that says to be a subject is to be an object, is to be a material entity. The human subject is a perceiving material, it's, it's a thing. I mean, this, this, my whole project came from a single insight when I was um, listening to a very mainstream feminist talk about um, media and stuff and said, well, here's, they're treated like an object and as a, continental philosopher influenced by phenomenology and existentialism, my first response was, but we are objects. How can that be a problem if we are objects? So you're absolutely right. In the end, I do want to um, collapse in terms of at least human existence, and it does lead to some really interesting, complicated philosophical questions about objects. Um, Sarah Ahmed has written about this, if anyone is interested, that, that I think would would um, satisfy you. Um, and, uh, and also, I think there's interesting work to be done on the subjectification of objects, but I'm not ready to do that yet. I read some research that, sh that was talking about the majority of men who use female sex workers um, being vested in the power dynamics that that person is there to fulfill their projections. So um, I can't, at the moment, I, it's hard for me to imagine um, how those men would remain interested in um, using the services of sex workers if that power dynamic wasn't there because I think like well over 80% of them have other partners who they have to have more reciprocal relationships with. Do you have a concept about what that would really look like? Yeah, I think I do and I think it's pretty utopian. It's pretty much what we call speculative philosophy. This um, part of philosophy's job is to imagine that which doesn't exist. Although I have to say, I don't think it is completely non-existent. So let me give you an example of sex work that I think, um, that I think meets the standard. And I don't know a lot about it, I want to learn more about it. But there are, are sex workers who work with disabled people um, to assist in having sexual interactions. Um, this to me is an example of sex work that is at least potentially, most likely probably non-derivatizing. Okay? Where the goal is not to, and, and this is how I understand dominant sex work, um, I'm going to simplify it right now, but is not to say, I want to have a sexual interaction where it's just what I want, and the other person is who I want the other person to be, and I don't have to deal with the other, and there will be no backtalk, or there will be only the kind of backtalk that I want. You know, that, that scripted sense. Whereas sex workers that assist disabled people in having sexual lives have to be very tied into their own particular expertise and the particular needs and desires of the client. So that would be an example. But when I talk about sex workers as doctors or lawyers, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a context of pervasive, deep gender sexual inequality. It doesn't cohere. It really requires an irrigorian sense of wonder, a sense that the other is not, this is another term I'm, I'm going to work with, colonizable. If the other is not colonizable, then a whole bunch of other things become possible and a whole bunch of other things become impossible. You really like the work you do, and it's such a bugger because it means that this, you know, this critique of objectification is one I can't make anymore. I have to use other language and so on. Anyway, but you know, that, that's uh, enormously valuable. I'm not convinced, though, that, it that the work you do, the really valuable conceptual and political work you do, requ requires a notion of fundamental sexual difference. So I'm not sure that you know, the argument about you know, the kind of ontological recognition uh, of subjectivity and so on requires irrigorized notions of sexual difference to work. Yep. <laughs> um, I need to think about that more. I think it needs difference. <laughs> 
I think it needs difference. I think we cannot get to the kind of valuing of embodiment and the valuing of relation without a theory of difference. I think sameness will lead us to a dead end. And we will not be able to get our way out of it conceptually. Race, ethnicity, yeah. So um, I take a rigor eye to be using sexual difference as a hint that difference is always in play. Differences, so you get a whole bunch of what a rigor I would recognize as female identified people together. Is difference out of the room? No. Other differences are allowed to emerge, but difference is always there. She does argue very controversially that sexual difference is the foundational difference. It's the most important one. She is uninterested in race. She says, it's just geography. <laughs> She's uninterested in queerness. She's like, yeah, there's something wrong with that. Okay. But I think, I do think, I can't, I can't get rid of her insight that the body is distinct. I don't think the body only comes in two flavors. But I do think the body is sexed. And I think human cultures have always had to grapple with that. And I, in the end, I cannot go with Judith Butler, who says that it is completely and utterly, all the way down, politically, socially constructed. But I know I'm on thin ice there. <laughs> There's no doubt. So maybe we should leave me on thin ice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.